Dylan? Where's Dylan? Yeah, there. You wanted to go first, so you want to get your computer sorted? Welcome to this year's lightning talks at Kiwi PyCon. Uh, first one up is Dylan Jay, and uh, he's going to do us a little bit of a, a presentation. Your five minutes starts straight away. Okay, so uh, let's say you've got your uh, idea for a great startup. It's going to be this fantastic program you're going to write, and people will type in, and it will talk back to you as if it's a, a pirate uh, uh, parent. It's just going to repeat back, but do it in pirate. So you, you write up, a, if, if you're a little bit me, you like to write it out as a story and what you're going to do. So you can write something like this. The next thing you do is you uh, build the app. So if we build the app, here's an example of it already built. So if I say hello, it's going to come back and say hello. Uh, how are you? Comes back and does this. So now let's have a little look at um, how we built that app. Um, for no apparent reason, it's, uh, uh, it's using WebSockets. Uh, it's actually using something called SockJS. Who's heard of SockJS? So SockJS is a wrapper on top of WebSockets plus all the other things, so it's very backwards compatible. Uh, and I've done that using, uh, if we have a look at our little HTML form there, and then we've got a little bit of um, JavaScript, not a lot of JavaScript. We, we override the send, submit, and then we have this connect function here. So we just connect to HTTP, SockJS, and that's it. Now the receiving end, uh, equally pretty simple. Um, it's using uh, Pyramid, and that's, that's all the code there. So uh, we have this thing called a session object, uh, and that has um, some methods. I've only used on message, but you can have on connect and, and so on. And all it actually does is takes the, uh, the information, and I call out to another function, which actually goes and does the translation, because I'm lazy. I don't want to actually turn it into uh, writing. So then you've done this part. Um, what you want to do is you want to test it. Um, so, what if we could just take this and we could turn this into an actual test? Well, we can. We're using something called Robot Framework here where we can just turn, um, I just used arbitrary kind of words here, but uh, what we do is we go down here and we define these extra things of what they should do, and it's using the Selenium syntax in this case. Robot Framework is a generalized testing framework. It has lots and lots of libraries. So you can test everything from iOS development using, um, these are just some of the external ones. You can do Windows tests and things like that. Um, and it's built on top of Python, so you can also write your own keywords and things in Python itself. And let's see it running. So if I, I run that test, it's going to open up the browser, type in some stuff, and it says test passed. It went pretty quickly, so we didn't really see it. But the nice thing about the robot framework is it gives us some nice results, um, tells me some information. And if I do things like, uh, for instance, I go back to my test, and I say, well, uh, change my test so it fails, run it again. It's going to come back up, and it's going to give me a whole bunch of information. Um, and in fact, this one, yeah, gives me a screenshot of exactly what it looks like at the point it failed. So, um, and on top of that, what I've used, uh, someone asked the question before about how you have these kind of environments and how you make it really easy to set up. If you go check out this repository, um, what this does is use build out. So because I'm using uh, Geovent, Unicorn, uh, uh, SockJS, a whole bunch of different dependencies and so on, um, this build-out file will go and build everything in one directory. You just write a few commands and, and you've got that entire environment set up, and including writing out configuration files and so on. Uh, and that's it. Thanks. I have a guest as well, Nick Phillips. Uh, oh no, I've just given you all my email address, my personal email address. What am I doing? Have I forgotten the first rule of never give your personal email address to a room full of strangers? Possibly. 
Uh, there's a story here, which I will tell you very quickly because I only have a few seconds. Two years ago, uh, in the build-up to Kiwi Pike on Wellington, Tim Penhay, who sadly isn't here this year, convinced me that it would be a really good idea to run a conference. And he said, oh, it'll be easy. You know, you just get a bunch of people in the room, throw some food at them, it'll be fine. Uh, so Kiwi PyCon happened last year in Dunedin, and it was the single hardest thing I've ever done in my entire life. <laughs> I finished it, and I vowed I was never again going to run a conference. It was a terrible way to waste a good six months of your life. Well, not waste, but you know what I mean. Uh, so we came to Kiwi PyCon this year, and we started realizing exactly how much we love Kiwi PyCon. It's great coming to these things and seeing all the amazing projects that you're all working on, but wouldn't it be great if we could see things that weren't just Python? Wouldn't it be great if there was something that was a bit more generic, a bit more technology focused, and something that celebrated the best aspects of technology innovation in our part of the country? So. Over the last couple of nights, over beers and scrawled on napkins, we have decided we're going to start a conference. We don't know what it's going to be called yet. Nick will tell you a bit more about what we're aiming for. Can we go on? Oh no, I screwed up my notes. <laughs> um, several years ago now, in about 2004, some of us in Dunedin thought it would be a good idea to organize LCA in Dunedin. And it's been a long time since I've thought about wanting to organize another conference after that as well. Um, but I think it's worn off, and I'm, I'm getting this idea that it would be a good idea. I think there's room in this country for a conference that is more general and higher quality uh, of talks and of attendees and size and so on. We're going to start small, but I, I want to aim to have something in this country every year, not just every few years when LCA decides, yeah, they'll let us have it in New Zealand or some other big conference comes here. But I think in the long run, we can aim to have a really good general conference in this country every year. Um, and we're going to try and get that started. I, I, th I think the best talks are either, in, well, the best talks are all of these, but talks need to be either inspiring to, to make you go and want to do something yourself. Um, they need to be about how to do things really well. They have to just be fascinating and, you know, and not particularly useful necessarily. Or they have to be about something important. So we'll be, we'll be hoping to get talks, you know, whether or not they're about Python, um, whatever they're about, something technological, not just open source even, although those criteria probably do lend themselves to open source. Um, and we'd like to see lots of people in Dunedin. We'd like to have your suggestions for what we should call this. And any other thoughts on what you think would go to make a great conference um, for New Zealand um, every year. So email Tommy. Right, so this is why my email address is up here. You should all write it down. Um, and if you can come up with a name, that would be great. Let me know. Uh, if you want to get involved, if you think you might be interested in sponsoring such an event, you should definitely talk to me. Um, I have to disappear before the end of the session, but Nick will be around until the end of the day. Otherwise, I look forward to your emails in my inbox. Thank you. My name's Clinton. I'm the coordinator of PyCon Australia uh, in 2014 and 15. It's going to be in Brisbane um, in the first week of August. Um, we've done a fair bit of prep for this conference. We are the same team that did LCA in Brisbane. Uh, we pulled that off a week after the city flooded, so um, we think we can handle all the natural disasters. Um, our main venue is the same venue that the G20 is going to be held at. Um, it's apparent, so Brisbane is now apparently cosmopolitan, um, so that should encourage you all to come. Um, it'll be a couple of months after the G20. Uh, that is an actual G20 response team in Brisbane, so you'll really be wanting, wanting to follow the uh, code of conduct. <laughs> um, it's, it's a lovely venue. It got uh, a little bit of a, a rinse out during the floods, so they've gone in and done some more renovations on it. Um, it's a, a lovely big venue with a lot of breakout rooms and um, we can have the good traditional talks, but we can also have lots of little areas for people to go away and do their own thing. 
Uh, a secondary venue that we haven't got um, locked in yet is essentially my second home at the State Library. Um, it's on the edge of the water, that's why it's called The Edge. Um, we, that's a multi-purpose um, environment, so we're hoping to hold the mini conferences there, we can have some breakout sessions, and we can also do a lot more hardware style hacking there. Um, so first week of August, um, South Brisbane, which is the cultural precinct of the cosmopolitan Brisbane. Um, it won't be this cold, and we'll have all of the, the main events that you expect, plus we're hoping to have some more student-based stuff, so some university level and some high school level and maybe younger. Um, we're hoping to have a lot of hardware events. I'm around until tomorrow, so if anyone's got any ideas or suggestions or they want to talk to me about doing stuff, uh, come and find me. Thanks very much. All right, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Jürgen, and um, I just have a question here. How many of you remember the times when your computer speed was measured in single digit megahertz and the RAM was measured in single digit kilobytes? Yeah, all the old guys raised their hands, that's right. <laughs> so um, back then we did amazing things, right, didn't we? We, we wrote stuff in assembler for example, and, and we squeezed the most amazing programs into four kilobytes of RAM, which would be posted somewhere in memory, and, and amazing stuff happened. And we did this, we were able to do this because we optimized our source code. So we, we optimized it for speed and for memory consumption. And uh, we did that because computing resources were expensive, right? Uh, the CPU cost, RAM cost a lot of money. These days we have gigahertz of uh, speed, frequency, we have gigabytes of RAM, and this sort of optimization comes a bit of a lost art. Um, but it's okay, because what people have realized is that these, these additional costs we pay in inefficiencies in our code, uh, computing inefficiencies, is made up of by increased programmer's efficiency. That's why we use languages like Python, for example, which are not terribly efficient if you compare it to machine code, obviously but which allow us to go from our idea to an actual working something much, much more quickly. But because developers' time is more expensive, developers, we, are more expensive than the computing resource, so it's okay to do this. But then why on earth don't we take some of the optimization that we used to know about and apply it to the one thing that these expensive resources, us, the developers, working on on a daily basis? And that's the source code. Uh, the source code, I believe, pretty strongly, should be optimized, not so much well, still for performance, obviously, it has to work, has to work well. But one thing that's forgotten is it needs to be optimized for reading. It needs to be read optimized because source code is, as you all know, read much more often than written. And there are lots of things you can do. Uh, starting to, to, to explain why on earth you are doing something in your source code might be a really good thing. People say, oh, source code is self-documenting. You can see I removed something from the list here. Yeah, well, I don't know why. Why do you do this, right? Maybe a little comment in there would help the person who comes after you. The code you write needs to be worked on by others, right? So make, uh, to be professional these days, the code needs to be optimized to such a way that other people can quickly, quickly pick up where you left off, where you, after six months of not looking at it, still figure out how, what you did there and why you did it. So there are lots of things you can do, aside from the uh, comments in the source code, with, which some people frown upon. You could use maybe, well, there's no law that says that a variable or function name needs to be shorter than eight characters and can't have any vowels in it or something like this. You can write descriptive variable names or function names. You can, you can, you can have some comments in your source code which actually helps you to, to explain this. And we all think we, we got it all figured out. We all think we are smart and we know how to do this. But um, I'm, I'm working on a pretty large, incredibly high profile uh, open source project which shall remain nameless, where, uh, where, uh, where, <laughs> where you'll find the most um, 
amazing source code. It's actually written in Python, which is a very readable language, which is, which is almost like it has been run through an obfuscator. It's unbelievable. So it's not really necessary to do this, right? We can, we can be better for, to ourselves, to our developers community, to the companies that we work for by focusing a little bit on optimizing our source code again. And the speed, yeah, right, but optimize for the most important and expensive resource, which is developers' time, getting up to speed, and, and, and understanding, and, and usually when you spend some time um, making your source code readable and understandable, you also end up with, you, you catch a couple of things along the way, and you, you end up with, with uh, source code that actually ends up a bit easier to maintain due to some of the steps you to take for this, right? So it's just, just basically maybe like a, um, a call to awareness that you're not the only one who, who looks at your source code, there are others, and it's worth it to spend some time optimizing it or re-optimizing it for human beings. All right, thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, a tiny talk on a project that I got dragged into by um, a large family that I'm associated with. Um, it has a different title than you might have thought it should have, it's this title because I did it for my family and they drove me in a way that nobody else would be prepared to. So it meant to them a lot more than, I suppose, in certain senses it mentioned to me. Uh, one thing's for sure, that if you're working for your family, they're going to be frank with you. It doesn't matter what they've asked you to do. Whatever you give them, they'll let you know exactly whether it suits them, if it's what they wanted, if it's what they asked for, and if it betrays them well enough. They want to see something nice, they want to see themselves looking good, and they want to make sure that it's easy for everybody. And the biggest complaints were that this was hard work. So what did they want? They wanted a family tree. Um, years ago, there'd been a huge family reunion down south. And I had like about 500 cousins in the nearby neighborhood down there, and a lot of other people came. So of course, there was plenty of data, but they wanted something pretty and a lot of um, details because everybody knows everybody, but we don't know how we're related. So, of course, they wanted to see themselves in it, and we're all from Ireland, and they wanted to see their own family. This is my father's family. So there's 13 in it, there's 10 and 12, and all sorts of numbers like that. In near recent generations, there was a gazillion people. So, they gave me a whole lot of pieces of paper, and a priest associated with the family had drawn up a whole lot of associations years ago. Some of it's true, some of it's inaccurate, but this is what I was supposed to work from. And all of these pieces of paper were connected, and I was supposed to plough through it and give them a family tree, and they wanted it on the web. So I looked through what was available to me on Linux, and there was something called Lifelines, which had stopped development at that time. This is back in 2008. And there was Gramps, which is a Python package for genealogy. So this is what um, aptitude or um, AppGet shows you is the description for Gramps, and the part that I should have taken notice of when I picked it was the part that I've highlighted in red. Gramps fits the needs of both amateur genealogists and senior serious genealogical researchers. Well, I was neither, and this wasn't supposed to be used for research, but it was all I could find. And somebody had told me you better make sure that it's compatible with GEDCOM. So I did that, that's why I picked Gramps. But what on earth is GEDCOM? It's an ancient, um, data form associated with geneolo genealogy, and it's variously Im implemented. There's all sorts of usage or Im interpretations of it, but that's the form of the data. It's text, it looks like COBOL or early Fortran to me, but that's what I thought I had to start with from those um, flowcharts. So the features of grants, first of all, that it's for research, not for um, family trees, it only provides an administration role. Nobody else can have a go at it. And I certainly wasn't prepared to do all of this on my own. So this has been the biggest problem. But that's what I got lumped with. Um, until 2011, it used Glade as a GUI. And it used um, Berkeley database. So it was just a whole lot of key value stores of Python objects that they dumped. And this meant to me at the time a newbie user in, in Python that I couldn't make out what on earth was going on. Um, it's since switched to Django in SQLite, but that's happened since I made my attempt to produce something 
for the crowd. It's point and click, and that's not my general mode either. So a few things ran against me. And the worst of all was that it doesn't really accept very easy CSV import. So the hardest part was getting the data in. So this was back in 2008. Um, I come from a big family. Everybody knows everybody. We're all related, but we don't know how we're connected. So that's what this was supposed to tell us, was how we're related. It grants provides good close-up shots, but we're far too bigly, big to be able to see the pictures. <laughs> There's certain features it's got that are good. It's got a calendar, and once I'd gotten into the um, code, because I didn't know Glade, I just got in there and configured things, and you're able to produce a calendar that turns off all the death dates. So you can print out a calendar for your family that shows you how old everybody would be now. So here's Grandma Kane down the bottom here. She's 119. And this was hilarious for the family. They really liked that one. But as far as family trees are concerned, this was what Gramps gave me. And this was only up to my generation. So this was crazy. Nobody could see anybody. We couldn't see any relationships. And of course, the people who really wanted it have already got bad eyesight. So they're not going to make anything of <laughs> this. So the whole verdict was, this is no good at all. Give us something else. And I'd done enough work by this stage that I was really stuck. OK, so I looked around. And um, Gramps uses graphers to produce its um, visuals. And it suggests something called ZGR Viewer to um, inspect the graphs. But that requires Java on their machines. And it's bad enough having to check that they've got Adobe Acrobat on their machines so they can see um, airline tickets when they come in the mail. So I certainly wasn't going to be installing Java. OK, so then I found. Um, D3, which is an SVG library, or it's a JavaScript library for scalar vector graphics, and um, Python's network module, which allows you to map out the tree, I did anyway, from my database into a graph, and then give or take a bit of in marriage that's gone in, in the family so that um, first cousins have married and so everybody's connected to their nearest relatives. I used D3 to get um, Altair for the yeah. browser. Where are we? Um, I can't wait. Who's the mouse? Here. Who's the mouse? Um, oh, it's here. Oh, damn, I'm sorry. I'm not a Windows know. user. Oh, Bigger party. Like. <laughs> Where's my page? Um, Tabs. Which one? This one. There. OK, so now we've got an SVG graph of the whole family tree. This is about six generations, far too many people to count. But at least people can see when their birthday is. All the information's here for everybody. And people started to get happy because they could see how on earth we're related to these nearest neighbours of ours. End of story. Oh, my God. OK. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know what the narrative for this talk is. It might be about really old software still being in the Ubuntu repositories. Hooray. It might be about how James can't give up on things and he's a bit of a hoarder. Whatever it is, it's going to be really like a Hollywood blockbuster. I don't know what the narrative is. It's just going to be one darn thing after another. Sorry. OK. I use a thing called Plan. It was written back in 1993, last maintained up in 2007, according to that, by some bloke. It's still out there. You can still have to get it. It's wonderful. It uses a thing called Motif, so it looks just like Windows 3.0, which was a good thing back in the day. Anyway, I used that from about 1998. Uh, my wife and I are stuck with it. We like it. It's um, multi-user users across the network, and most importantly, it's synced to my Palm Pilot 3X. <laughs> right. It had a file format. Wow. I had some trousers to pick up. That was really important that day, so there it is. Um, it's kind of obscure. Uh, you can kind of see what's happening, but it's really concise. Back in 1993, we didn't have a lot of bandwidth, so that was kind of what you did to keep things little, right? I didn't need to deal with that. It was just the format. Come 2009, my Palm Pilot went away. I got an Android phone. Android phone didn't sync to this thing anymore. It wanted vCalendar, iCalendar. Uh, we must have a lot of bandwidth nowadays, because there's a shed load more 
stuff up there now. But I'm still picking up trousers. That's good. OK, so what I did was I wrote a Python program that was going to take the first format, turn it into this format, and then, uh, oh, Android. So what do I want to do with Android? I want to get it into my Google Calendar. That's OK, because Google Calendar will upload things from other websites. So once I had this format, I was good to go. Good to go for several years, just uh, everything turning up on the phone, nice and easy. Um, and, oh, a little bit of information about the thing I wrote. So it's, it's a um, Python program. I used some information from a Perl thing that someone else had written. Unfortunately, what they wrote was take it in and then hard code what uh, iCalendar looks like. I didn't like that, so I used a thing called the object. Um, if I'm using a, a software with really good libraries, use good libraries. Um, some time date stuff. It's on Launchpad, because I'm not cool enough to be on Git. Sorry, guys. And that was all fine up until last year. In the last year, we've been a year now with Google Now. Suddenly, my calendar is still on the phone, but Google Now doesn't know about it. Because for Google Now to know about your calendar, it has to be actually the, the private calendars, not the sort of imported from the side calendars. So now I'm going to have to rewrite all this thing with a Google API, talking directly to Google, sucking it out, and I think I'm going to end up writing a socket thing that'll replace the client, uh, sorry, the server side. Ah, joy. Thank you. I have eight seconds of slides. Let's do this quickly. Um, I'm not trolling all of you, first and foremost. I know it looks like I'm trolling, but I'm not. OK. Um, I know Python. I was giving a tutorial on Twisted on Friday. Um, I write Python for my day job. It's awesome. I know Python. I love it. I write network programs in Python. I love Twisted. Twisted is awesome. Come ask me about Twisted. I'll tell you about Twisted for hours. It is so much fun. Um, I write everything in Bottle. I use SQL Alchemy. I learned about the joys of SQL Alchemy after spending years writing SQL. You can ask Tom Eastman. I owe him a giant apology in public. This is almost it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> almost, but not quite. But there's always a but in these stories. Um, everything new I'm writing myself um, for web tech is in Ruby. So why am I doing that? Well, let me tell you about this cool thing I found in Ruby that I use. It's called OmniAuth. OmniAuth is a rack middleware that handles authentication for all of my website things that I might want to write. So, okay, we've got that. Rack, if you've not worked with Ruby, is like WSGI. Pretty much exactly the same onion structuring. OmniAuth is a generic auth provider hook system. So it injects auth into your request, and then you get a thing in your methods that works like you'd expect. Okay, so far, uh, too far. This is exactly like repos.who, which if you've worked with WSGI, you've probably heard of. This is, I think, associated with the BFG pylons project now, but I don't know for certain. It's been a while since I touched this. Um, but the difference is OmniAuth supports literally everything out of the box with a consistent interface. And by consistent interface, I mean there is a dict that I get that's always the same. And when I say everything, I mean I can write a bit of code and do Facebook and Twitter and email and Persona, and Flickr, and Pick Please, and Box, and Dropbox. And the list goes on kind of ridiculously. There's over 100 items on this list of strategies that they've got. So I can download code once and use it to do anything I want. I don't have to keep rewriting code. But this is Python. Why do you care? I'm lazy. I hate writing auth code. Why isn't there whiskey for this? So do I just not know about it? This is entirely possible. This is why we're having this lightning talk, because you can tell me, because I don't know. I really want you to tell me that I'm wrong. Please tell me. But I have had objections, like, Django does this. Well, yeah, but here's a link. Really cool thing. Django has a lot of these things. Django isn't WSGI. I write Bottle. I write Flask. I don't write Django apps. I keep it very small. In Ruby, I write Sinatra. Flask, I'm told, also, this looks really cool. Um, same sort of things. It does most of what I want. It doesn't advertise it itself as WSGI middleware, but I only glanced at it a little bit. Looks like it hooks in through Flask plugins. So it was also really hard to find. I'm searching for WSGI plugins. I'm searching for WSGI auth layer. I'm not finding anything. 
So I couldn't find this. It had to be pointed out to me explicitly, like, go look at this thing. Not quite as complete as OmniAuth, does most of it. There's also this one. Another social auth plugs into Flask, Django, and Pyramid, I believe. But again, it's plug-in oriented. It's not designed to just slot in like a WSGI application. Does it matter that it's not WSGI? Should I even be caring about this? Did WSGI die? Has WSGI died? Do people still do WSGI things? There we go, yes. What else is there? What am I missing? Please tell me I'm wrong, because I want to come back to Python. I love writing SQL Alchemy. SQL Alchemy is so much fun. It's so much nicer than Data Mapper in Ruby or Active Record in Ruby, but OmniAuth really kind of kills it, and I can't use anything but that. So come tell me in the break afterwards. I need to know. Thank you. Don't have any flash slides, I'm afraid. Um, I'm going to talk to you briefly about uh, a, a little program I wrote last year called Shard. Um, and, and, and first, let's talk about the, the, the motivation behind Shard. It, it was about trying to provide uh, a way of decoupling the source of information from, um, from those receiving it. So in other words, you, didn't, you, you don't want to. It's, it's a little bit like Tor, I guess, that you're trying to uh, obfuscate the, the source of information um, from, from the person receiving it. And, and what Shard does effectively is take, take files um, on your hard drive and it breaks them up into whole little, little bits and it, it merges them with other bits of file uh, using XOR. So you have three or four different files uh, in each segment and it creates all these little munged shards which you can then upload to things like Dropbox and, and other uh, you know, H, uh, any kind of HTTP web server. So you make them available in public. And then the recipes are used to be able to reconstitute those files. And, and one of the uses that for, for this kind of technology is you can, because you, the recipes are the ones that are used to reconstitute the files, you can distribute these, these files across the internet wherever you want to put them. And then they don't make any sense just by themselves. So if you, want to, if you have a video you want to distribute but you don't necessarily want to make it obvious where it, where it came from, you can put these shards all around the, the internet. You can also use shards from other projects or other, other, other things that people are using. So it's not sure that, you know, no one can be sure based on the, 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 the source of the shards themselves where the source is coming from because there, there's multiple people involved. And then you share the recipe about how to make the, the end files um, separately from, you know, so in other words, it looks like you, you know, no one can be sure that you are the source of the recipe either. You basically sure that, uh, share that as a separate task, okay, you know, share it with your friends, they share it with their friends, etc. But there's nothing that indicates that you are the source necessarily. And what it means is that the you can never be sure what a particular shard is involved with. Okay, so you can't, um, you, you can't by reading it, tell what the information is until you get the recipe and be able to reconstitute the file. Um, and so this has interesting ideas. One of, one of the things I've been working with is, um, in Pakistan, there, there, there are a, a subset of atheists. Um, these people are in mortal danger of their life. If, if they are known, they could be um, arrested, tortured, perhaps even killed. And one of, the, one of the interesting things, I mean, I don't think this is a complete solution, but I, I'm looking at ways where these people can share it and not, and not have the information get back to them. In other words, a, a way of anonymous sharing, which, of course, um, you know, there's, there's other systems, you know, WikiLeaks and so on, but this is more of a decentralised way of trying to um, put information out there um, while having plausible deniability, so you know, so that the information, the definite information, can't be sourced back to the to the source of that information. Um, so yeah, it's it's one of these projects which um, you know obviously has use in that area and may have uses um, in other areas where you want to um, hide where the where the source of information is coming from. Thank you.
Hello. Um, I was just uh, going to... It was completely unplanned. I just put it up there and then went, oh, uh, I was just sitting here for the last 10 minutes going, oh, what am I going to say? Anyway, um, so <laughs> I'm a, I work at Catalyst and um, part of my day job is um, digital object repositories, which uh, sounds really vague, but um, I'll quickly show you if I can. Is it? Um, mm -hmm, here's... So, um, <clears throat> to the general public, a digital object repository, well, this particular, this system is called Fez, by the way, it's all written in PHP. Uh, Fez, like the silly hat. Um, and uh, it's mostly in PHP, but it uses Solar and Fedora, which are both Tomcat, Java, monolithic blobs um, behind the scenes. And the idea is that universities grab it and they put all their journal articles and their preprints and their conference papers and their theses and their books and book chapters and everything that they publish, all their sort of academic research output uh, gets shoved into one of these. And then the general public can come along and go, uh, telecommunications infrastructure. And, um, oh look, a bunch of records and um, faceted search and all the shiny stuff and author and blah, blah, blah. Um, now, the, the, the thing about this is that there, is, there are two really cool proprietary um, systems that librarians uh, around the world um, uh, use and um, Jay mentioned one of them at his talk earlier today. And um, they're really cool and really flexible and really functional and all that. But in open source land, we've got Fez, which is used by about four Australian universities. Um, we've got DSpace, which is a Tomcat Java application, which is used by practically everyone else. And then there's ePrints, which is written in Perl, and that's written, <laughs> that's uh, used in the UK, actually, a fair bit. Um, they're all... Yeah, I don't know. Unsatisfactory in some manner. Um, different ways. They all have their different strengths. Um, but none of them do all of it well. So what I'm here to do was really sort of go, ah, we need to write one from scratch in Python. And um, I was sort of, for some reason, thought that this would be more of a two-way thing. You know? <laughs> But then I was sat here going, oh, actually, this is uh, very much one way. So, um, <laughs> so <laughs> never mind. But, uh, yeah, I, um, I, I want to talk to Jay at National Library, uh, if he's here. There he is. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll be having beer later on or whatever. And, um, but if anyone else has any cool ideas in this sort of area or has any thoughts or, like, whatever, then um, definitely talk to me um, after. Or whatever. Anyway, I'm probably about out of time. And I'll see you later. Bye. Bye. <laughs>
tiny, tiny fraction of all of the open source projects that are ever initiated. And so I wanted to be in that long tail. It's actually an exponential distribution. Open source is not normal. It's exponential. And so I had ultimately to, to try for really three years everything I could think of to make my open source project grow. And it never did. And I had a PhD to complete. So I turned from looking at the practicalities of doing open source to, to this sort of scientific modeling of, of, and simulation of the open source development project growth process. And it turns out you can model it very simply through a, a process called preferential attachment, which says if you look at all the open source projects out there and you find one that where there's somebody you know is already working in that project and you go and join them, well, that gives you that pattern. And the link that you have here, the web toy, is a simulation, which uh, you probably won't be able to see all the details here. Um, but this is what it looks like if you load it up in your, your browser. You have to have Java in, in your browser. It's written in a language called NetLogo, which if you ever want to do simulations, I highly recommend it. It's very uh, fun to use. Just click Setup and then Go. And you'll get this um, chart which runs, uh, if I can mark on here, this is time going in this direction. So it's like a piano roll that goes up. And each of the green dots on the, the graph that's generated is a project. And all the red dots are developers that have joined the projects over time. And then over on the left here, you'll see is, oh, you're not seeing that? OK, is, is a, a histogram, which ultimately reflects the, the number of projects. Most of the projects have one developer. Occasionally, a project has quite a few developers. And this, this simulation only runs until a total universe of 250 projects have been created. But you can see, of all the developers that potentially could be engaged in open source development in this scenario, about 13% of them are actually involved in the projects. And about a, only a third of them are on multiple developer projects. So uh, the, the simulation actually very closely uh, models um, what we see happening in the real world. A lot of developers not engaging in open source the way they might. And what the, the simulation also shows as a side effect is that the big projects tend to be the older ones. They've been around, they've had people join them, they've gotten to be bigger. And so the real bottom line lesson of this whole thing is join together. Find projects that you are interested in, the two of you together will make something that'll be bigger and better and more interesting for that third, fourth, fifth developer. Uh, and the more we join together, the better open source will be. Hi guys, my name's William. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> hi, hi guys. Um, there's a lot of um, really awesome um, Python uh, modules um, for wrappers for various websites online. Um, one I particularly enjoy is uh, Last.fm. Um, do we have any Last.fm users in the house? Nice, nice. It's a, yeah, I just recently just had over 100,000 plays. Um, so yeah. Yeah, it's a great website. So you can, um, they've got a really nice, it's called PyLast module um, that you can go and grab a lot of information from um, from that website. Um, so check it out. Yep. Uh, Last.fm is a music website that kind of records your music playing history um, as you listen to it. So you can keep, you can go back and have a look at like what you listened to like three years ago on, on Tuesday in April. So it's very specific. Um, it's, yeah, so it's got a lot of information about artists and that. Um, another one I've been looking at a lot recently, but more, but more local is uh, the Trade Me one. Because um, I'm really interested in like pulling data from like 
music data from Last FM and then music data from Trade Me and kind of mixing stuff together, creating thing, working on creating like a, a blog post um, with data together, like sending it off to WordPress. So yeah, there's, yeah, that's my talk. Thank you. Okay, uh, this is about Pickle. You've all heard of Pickle, but in case you haven't, there are three binary serialization libraries built into Python. They are Pickle, Marshall, and Shell. Now, Marshall, don't use that. All these moons are yours except Europa. Attempt no landings there. Marshall is used internally by Python. That's the format of a .pyc file. It changes a lot, even between like point releases, 3.7 point or 3.4.1 and 3.4.0. It would actually might change in between. Don't use Marshall. It's not for you. Um, Shelf, on the other hand, is Pickle with the DBM module slapped on top of it. So it's really not getting you anything above Pickle itself. Um, if you're going to live with Pickle, you might as well use Pickle directly. So Pickle will solve your problem, but you need to change the, f the way that you approach solving your problem in the first place. You need to sort of meet Pickle in the middle. So um, uh, I wanted to write a, a game. This is uh, uh, meal.py. Uh, it's an implementation of a popular card game. Uh, I wrote it in Python 3, and I wanted uh, to automatically save and restore state. So you actually, when you're done playing, you hit Control C, and it just remembers where you are, and you pick up where you left off. So obviously, I wanted to use Pickle for this, um, but there were a couple of surprises. The first one is that Dunder init is not run on an object that is deserialized from pickled state. So um, when you, if you have, if if you're evolving your program and you add new data members to your program and you just add them in the constructor, well, if you added name after you already had some pickled stuff, then a depickled one of these foo objects is not going to have a name. So don't do this. Try and do this instead. We are adding the members, new members, into the class itself. This, of course, means that you're going to have to use something that's immutable. Uh, but uh, if you need to have a mutable object there, then you just set a default, and you detect it in the init. And uh, you may have to have a function you call every time you depickle uh, an object. So the second surprise is that dunder new is called for objects that you uh, depickle. So you can actually put code in dunder new if you're clever, um, but dunder new is something that I tend to try and avoid running. Um, third, um, I wasn't sure how to word this. So what I say here is all pickled classes must be at module scope and must be consistently named. And what I mean by that is if you do something clever, like you're creating your own types at runtime, uh, uh, the function call type with, that takes three arguments so you can create a, a new type object at runtime, um, you have to assign that to a variable that has the same name as the name you gave the class. The easy thing, of course, is just to use the class keyword. But if you're creating dynamic types, you need to make sure that you name the class x, you name that variable x. Because what Pickle does, when it reconstitutes one of these objects, it actually goes into your module and gropes around and looks for an attribute on the module with that name, and it uses that to try and create the object. And it assumes it's a class, and it's not going to call in it. Finally, um, everybody knows that Pickle uh, is very clever. And if you have objects that have references to each other, and you may have like four references to the same object, um, Pickle will reconstitute all that state the same way. If you have an, uh, that object that had four references to it, those four references will be recreated. But that's only true across one call to pickle.dump. If you, if you make three or four calls to pickle dump and you have that object involved, then it's going to have, you're going to have four different objects essentially. So you don't want to make multiple calls to pickle dump. In short, um, don't do this. Don't call pickle dump separately for your, your uh, objects. Um, what you should do, and this is my final actual recommendation for exactly what you should do when you're dealing with pickle. Take all of your top level objects, stick them in a single dictionary, pickle that dictionary, unpickle that dictionary and restore it. Um, that will solve all of your problems. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tom. So, um, Tom? After I um, was working full time, I managed to do the build script in Python, and I made my own company after a while. Um, we measure power usage data. We started off measuring power usage in um, my dad's eco home, you know, for our own interest. But we, um, we actually invent devices because we used to make custom electronics for third parties. So we made our own devices to measure power usage because the ones off the shelf weren't good enough. 
So the two devices you see there, the, the, the block-shaped one is the grid hub, and the little widgy one is the grid node. The grid node goes in the breaker box, it measures power usage, you plug sensors into it. The grid hub talks to the web. Now the part where you get to the web is where, where Python gets involved. So on the web, <coughs> we've got a twisted application that accepts TCP IP connections from the grid hub. And it maintains that connection, and it then streams the data into a PostgreSQL database. Now, from the very get-go, I wanted real-time data. I wanted the customer to be able to click here and see second-by-second second updates of how much power is being used right now. Now, this is in Australia, and this has been installed by an auditor who's a customer of ours, and this is how much power they're using in their business. So they can click here, and they can see how much power is being used on different circuits. And over the next five minutes, it's going to accumulate. So the way this works is that Twisted connects to the Grid Hub, and then it connects to Node.js just as a proxy, and then the browser connects through Socket.js to Node. And I use that architecture because the um, Django implementation of Socket was not good enough at the time. Twisted, sorry. Um, and I'm hoping it'll help my scaling later on. So on the browser, I'm using um, Floater 2, and I'm using, um, uh, I can't remember the name of the framework, five minutes, got to be fast. Um, so what's quite interesting about this implementation, I've got this here for the one second data. You can navigate it, it's hierarchical. You can see the historical data. You can click and drag this and change the sampling regime. So what I'm concerned about on the server is being able to aggregate the data you just saw there. This browser just made requests in the background to my, my server in order to get the data. So you can see very quickly this data coming back. So I'm thinking about how to do this. Right now there's too much work happening in Postgres to do this. So I'm thinking about changing to pandas. I was originally planning to write something in C, but based on this conference, I've learned about pandas, so thanks for the recommend, um, and lots of other stuff. Um, so really quickly, here's um, my back end. So this is, um, everything's uh, served through Nginx. Nginx talks to Django, Nginx serves static resources, Nginx talks to um, Twisted. So this is a Twisted application that served this request, and this is my back end view of a grid hub. So I can see all sorts of useful stuff. We've got logs here. I've got information about what it's doing. Um, I've got the ability to look on its flash. It's got files in there. I can choose some firmware and send the firmware to this device. So I send some test firmware, for instance. And um, once the firmware is on the device, there's a micro SD card, I can upgrade the firmware of the grid hub through this web interface. So basically, Python's blown my mind. You know, Every time I want to do something, I look on online, there's massively awesome resources. There's Twister, there's Django, there's NumPy, there's SciPy, there's I IPython. Um, I'm going to use Pandas soon. Um, I just learned about Scython, which I thought was going to be hard. I learned about Process, which I thought was going to be hard. So I want to thank everyone here, uh, and every, especially the main core contributors for the awesome resources that Gridspy is built on. So um, anyone want to hear more about the, the firmware? Firmware? Uh, real time? Anyone want to know anything about real time? OK, so for the real time aspect of, of, of the system, um, there's firmware for TCP IP. Um, it connects through to Twisted. Twisted in internally has a TCP IP connection. It runs a, a server, and then Node.js connects to that server to register itself as forwarding data. And then the web browser um, opens a web socket. So because it's um, socket.io, uh, I think it's, let me just bring up the, the inspect window, inspect element. No, I can't bring up this, I don't know this browser well enough. Um, if you look at the web software, you can see these little JSON requests going through from the browser saying, I want to watch X, I want to watch Y. So essentially, I'm entering a chat room. So I took the chat room concept from socket.io, and I reproduced the idea. So every building is a chat room. So if I go into a different building, here's some public ones, I can log in to see something else. As soon as I click live data, it, it registers in the chat room, and then the server goes and tells the grid hub to connect. Now, this one is, is, is notorious. The, um, it's running old firmware on the grid hubs. Unfortunately, there's a bug. It doesn't always, it's not always online. I could probably find out, actually, it is offline by looking at the server, but we don't have time. So let's try a different one. So as soon as I entered this room, um, Node.js was told by the browser that there's someone connected to it. In fact, I've maintained the same connection. This is a one-page application. Um, it told Twisted, Twisted told the device, and then we started streaming data. Um, any questions at all, quickly? Okay, last thing to say, um, the entire stack is my work um, in terms of web development, some of the firm is not. So um, it's taken years and years to get this far. It's been really hard to try and develop all these different parts and sell the product at the same time. So if you're trying to do the same thing, it is hard. 
Keep going, you can get there.